I'm Michael Bain and welcome to Triggered, coming to you of course from the secret hidden bunker in the Rocky Mountains on a beautiful if smoky fall day here. And we've got a real treat today. I have an interview with Martin Tuasen, who of course is the president and CEO of Arms Corps and Rock Island Armory, a good personal friend of mine. And I reached out to him to talk about a little bit of the future of Arms Corps, some of the things that you might see coming up, and some of the challenges he had manufacturing arms in the Philippines in a year of COVID-19. One of the things Martin asked me was, hey, what are your three favorite Arms Corps Rock Island Armory guns? So, Martin, I'm answering that question for you today. Number one on my list is this, that's a VR-80 shotgun. It's 12 gauge shotgun semi-auto essentially built on an AR platform made in Turkey and I cannot say enough good things about this gun. I shot it in 3-gun and it raised me up in 3-gun because I was no longer stuffing shotgun rounds into a tubular magazine. Instead I had these. These magazines make sense. This is a nine round magazine with a three round Taylor Freelance magazine extension on it, so I got a dozen rounds here. I also have five round magazine for it. For it. What I use those magazines for are different loads. In a three gun match, you might have to shoot buckshot, you might have to shoot slugs. So I have those rounds in the five round magazines, which by the way, I have different color Freela uh, Taylor Freelance magazine extensions on them. So they're eight round magazines, but I can tell immediately that it is not carrying my usual three gun load. Other points about this, uh, this shotgun that I totally love. This is Magazine Well from Amarok Tactical. There's a number of different ones, but it makes a real difference if you're running and gunning with this gun because you're grabbing these long unwieldy magazines off your belt it helps to have this big funnel here running a red dot I've been I ran through the season with a Romeo 4 a SIG Romeo 4 and I have no reason not to leave it on there it has been a workhorse sight on a workhorse gun I did change out things like stock I did change out the pistol grip the other thing I did really complicated kids. I changed the bolt handle from the right side to the left side. Why? Because the left side is where the bolt handle needs to be. I do not want to operate the gun with my strong hand, the operating hand of the gun. I found nothing in 3-Gun that made me dislike this shotgun. I liked it so much that I'm now looking at it as a home defense shotgun as well replacing my Versamax, replacing my Mossberg 930. It's been a rock. Whatever I load in it, it runs. So, let's go to Martin Tuasen, of course, through Zoom, and see what the future of the VR80 might be. So you're right. expanding Vegas, and is that yes. where you're? Our, we have uh, currently two projects for in-house and one OEM project we're working on. Uh, the, the handgun will come out fairly shortly and we'll be able to show that to you. And then the other firearm category, uh, we're waiting for a nice little letter from ATF. We're pretty 100% sure we're following all the ATF guidelines. Um, so they shouldn't be denying us. Uh, and when you see that bad boy, Michael. The pistol's nice. I'm not going to say the pistol's not nice. It's a dream pistol for us. I mean, it's got patents inside, everything. Uh, but that shotgun is just so mean looking and it follows all the rules. I can't, you know, I'm a gun lover. You know that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a gun nerd boy. <laughs> I guarantee you, you and every one of the friends that you have to shoot to shoot guns. Joe's going to call you up. Everybody's going to go, Joe's going to want one so bad. It looks so bad. You can't imagine how good it is. I mean, I, I, it really, you want to talk about something happy? That to me is, is a easy, easy uh, 100,000, 200,000 uh, guns a year. And we're going to 
build the U.S. facility around that, employ hundreds of Americans. I mean, you know, you know, right now our little factory in Nevada, you know, we got we got 60 people in the warehousing and 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 the import side, and, uh, and you know, we got 52 people in Montana right now, uh, you know, and we got six people, engineers mostly, machinists, getting these prototypes ready, getting all that stuff, and but. I've already got about 30 CNC machines and we're, oh, wow. and, and we're ready. We're just waiting for that letter from ATF. When that letter from ATF comes in, woo-wee. <laughs> this week's Triggered is brought to you by Franklin Armory, the home of innovation in firearms. Volkortsen, engineering the world's best rim fires. Taurus, USA. Designed to protect. Lipsies and their great guns of the month. And Revolution Targets, 21st Century Steel. Welcome back to Triggered and my special interview with Martin Tuasen from Arms Corps, Rock Island Arms. And I'm also answering Martin's question, which is, what are your three favorite Arms Corps Rock Island guns? By the way, of course, Arms Corps as a sponsor has been for many, many years. I've been with them in the Philippines. The Tuasen family are good, good friends of mine. Now, I haven't had as much time on this gun as I probably should have, but I love it because isn't it a nasty looking little thing? This is the 310, which is three inch barrel, 10 shot, 45 ACP 1911 platform gun. What I like about this gun is number one, it's little. You know, we have moved to a universe where we're using smaller and smaller carry guns. And for people who want to stay in the 45 universe, which I think is fine, certainly I carried 45s for a lot of years, to me, this is an excellent little gun to do it with. Among other things, as it comes from the factory, it has an excellent four and a half pound trigger pull. And one of the things you get a 1911 for is because the trigger pulls can be so well tuned. Well, you don't have to tune anything off this little guy. It is actually perfect, absolutely perfect carry gun trigger pull. Another thing about this gun that I like, because I have little girly man fingers, I have found that it's really easy for me to depress the grip safety on this gun. It's got a good beaver tail, which you're going to need with recoil. But using this gun, I have never had an issue not being able to make sure that the grip safety comes off. So good trigger, it looks good, skeletonized hammer here, an excellent set of adjustable sights, fiber optic front sight. Once again, this is a little 10 round monster. And I think it's good that if you look around someplace like the blowout houses, CDNN, something like that, you can find para double stack 45 magazines really, really cheaply, para ordnance magazines that fit this gun. That way you can go from the 10 rounds in the magazine if you have to reload to a 12 round magazine. Although I haven't tested the larger capacity magazines yet, but it's not impossible. I still have a few left over from 20 years ago. That's something I want to do with this gun. So to me, this represents a commitment to carry guns. And one of the things that I talked to, to Martin about when I was in the Philippines last is I said, I like the 310. I think this is a super little gun. Oh boy, if this super little gun was an aluminum frame nine millimeter, I'd be even happier. Happy, happy, joy, joy, joy. So let's cut over to Martin in the interview and let him tell us where the 310 is going. Um, we came out with the 310 and 45, mm -hmm. right? Cool, and cool little gun. So people have been enjoying it. People have been getting it. Um, and uh, the one thing I've heard uh, from the buyers was, why didn't you do it 9 millimeter? Right? Oh, well, yeah. hmm. You heard that from me, I think, in the Philippines, too. Yeah, uh, good, good question, right? So oh, uh, the issue with that was since uh, there's no magazine out there for a short, stubby, double stack, nine millimeter, uh, yeah. I couldn't come out with one right away. We're close. I can say that 
uh, ATF already has approved the actual nine millimeter pistol for importation. Um, and we have one functioning with some makeshift magazines that we did. We cut down um, some Mechdar magazines and modified them so that we could use that. But we're, we're almost done. Uh, and once those mags come out, we'll start importing them in January. So it'll be a nine millimeter uh, version of the, uh, the 310. But I think we get two extra rounds. You can actually take, technically get two extra rounds into the magazine. But um, I'm not so sure because I think we want to sell it in all the 10 round states too. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure what marketing wants to do with it, but I know that on a phys physics aspect, we get two extra rounds in our magazine. Um, well, it's a great a little platform. I mean, what, you know, it's a, it's a great carry gun in 45 ACP. You know, we're talking about a, a very small 1911 platform, but in nine millimeter, you know, yeah. it, it becomes a sweetheart. Uh, get an extra two rounds, less recoil, um, you know, easier to rack back the slide, get a little lighter recoil spring. Um, I think it'll be a winner, especially since everything, you know, everybody really, really loves nine millimeter in, in the United States, you know. Uh, I mean, just look at the success of the 320 and, and, the, and Glock and, and Smith and, you know, it, it's it's there. It's it's a nine millimeter. You know, ammunition nowadays when they do the hollow point stuff is is so effective. Not like the old days where you know, shot nine millimeter, you shoot somebody nine ten times, right, and and they'll survive it, right. But you know, that's the whole point of forty five: big and slow and drop it, right. <laughs> and and uh, well, you know, the history of the nineteen eleven. If anybody yeah. wants. Google it, you know, it's, it was made for the Philippines to shoot Muslims in the Philippines during the Muslim war. That's where it came <laughs> from. Yeah. The revolutionary TCM from Rock Island Armory. Fire it once and you'll be hooked. The first thing you'll notice is its sonic boom and enormous muzzle flash as it hurls the exclusive Arms Corps 22 TCM round downrange at a blistering 2,000 feet per second with penetrating impact. It shoots surprisingly easy with light recoil. The 17 round TCM series. So fun to shoot. It's like a thrill ride, only better. Welcome back to Triggered and my three favorite Arms Corps guns, along with our interview with Martin Kowasson, president of Arms Corps. And I couldn't leave the show without showing you this guy, which is maybe my all time favorite Arms Corps gun. It is a long slide, large capacity, 10 millimeter, designed specifically for hunting. Now, basically, I talked a lot to Kaloy Tuasen, also works there at uh, with Martin, part of the family there that, that owns Arms Corps. And he put this gun together initially, the raw parts of this gun together for me, again, as a hunting gun, as a dedicated hunting gun. And when I got it, I thought, wow, it's really cool, but I want a red dot on it. And specifically, I want a frame-mounted red dot. I do not want the dot to move. I want that dot to stay right where it is, even as the gun is recoiling. So, I reached out to my good friend, Sean McHugh at Cylinder and Slide Shop in Nebraska. And I said, hey, hey, I'm building up a 10 millimeter long slide hunting gun. And I want you guys to go through it. It already is in really good shape, but I want you to go through it. I want you to make a few changes. I want you to go to a really light trigger. Now remember, for a competition gun, I don't necessarily want a super light trigger because sooner or later I'll put a round right there into the ground. But on a hunting gun, I want the lightest, crispest trigger I can get, and that's two pounds on this gun. Secondly, Sean mounted this, essentially screwed to the frame, and it is a mount for a, an aim point, a, T, a T1, H1, T2, H2, whichever. I believe the mount is made by the uh, Double Alpha Academy, who makes a lot of competition parts. You see a very similar setup to this on a lot of the competition guns. But I never got to take this gun on a hunt, because you know how it goes. You have all these plans, and the next thing you know, eh, it slips by you. Well, maybe this fall, and if not this fall, an interesting competition is coming up in June. It's a handgun hunting competition. And it's all steel targets, 
30 yards to 200 yards up in Wyoming, the targets will be partially concealed as it might be in a hunting situation. And all your positions are field positions. That is right in my wheelhouse. And that is what this gun is built for. Well, those are my three favorites. One of the things I asked Martin about though was, how did he go about keeping his company going and keeping his employees safe manufacturing guns in the Philippines during COVID. Manila got hit very badly. And some of the lockdowns in the Philippines were absolutely draconian. So Martin and the whole team at Arms Corps went 24 seven to make sure that their employees were safe. And just as importantly, that their employees had a job. The, the Philippines got clobbered by COVID. And Arms Corps, they're right there. All of a sudden, the roof falls in. Talk a little about that. I'm at Iwa. Show gets canceled. Everything starts shutting down. I mean, you know, the whole world starts shutting down. All right, we got maybe a thousand cases in the Philippines at, 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 on March 15th when the U.S. Uh, stops uh, Americans from coming in. Italy's on fire, right? And uh, on the 17th of March, the president says, we're going to go on a full lockdown. And I'm like, full lockdown? What does that mean? The rules didn't even come out after he announces it. Just nobody's allowed to leave the house. I know you employ a lot of people. If those people can't come to work. Yeah, um... 700 people uh, at the factory. And... Uh, uh, we're not 1,700 anymore, unfortunately. COVID did have its toll. Um, forced us to lean up a little bit, especially at the, uh, uh, once the rules came out and we were allowed to do some furloughs and some retirements. Um, first set of rules was, uh, we call it ECQ, Enhanced Community Quarantine. I love this stuff. Filipinos love this stuff. So uh, basically, Enhanced Community Quarantine is you have to leave your house. No more than one person can leave your house at any one point in time. And uh, essential businesses such as groceries, food processing, hospitals uh, are allowed to function. We're not an essential business. Uh, the Philippines has not had the Second Amendment. Unfortunately, when uh, the Americans left and left us to be independent, they helped us set, us set up the Constitution, but they forgot the Second Amendment. We got raw materials. We got everything. Let's let's kick up let's kick it up a little bit. Get see how many people we can get to the factory. The rule was um, we could run a skeleton crew as long as we housed them and um, fed them and kept them from leaving the factory and contaminating other people. If they were all COVID free, they could stay and work. So we found 323 volunteers to come in out of the uh, 1,700 employees we had. And we went into the essentials, 5.56, five, 9 millimeters, 7.62 uh, for our government contracts and for the U.S. market. First week of July, we had 937 uh, people working in the factory, uh, 24 hours a day, sleeping and eating in the factory. Um, we, allowed, uh, we allowed them to go home when the rules changed. And then uh, our first case of COVID hit. Uh, and so we had one case, one. 1,600 people, we had one case in five months. I don't know how contagious this is, but one case out of 1,600, those numbers don't add up. Odds are I should have had, you know, five, 6% of my population with COVID at least. Right. Right? Uh, and uh, they, he goes home, we contact trace the 22 other people, they all test negative. City government says they still can't come back to work for 14 days. So I lose 22 guys there. And because of that one case, 132 of my guys don't come back to work the next day because they're scared of getting COVID. Oh, oh. And these are, these are because I've been in the factory, and these are people that want to work. This is a great job to have in the Manila uh, area. For sure. In Marikina, we're the highest paying in the whole, the whole city. So you come work for me, people sue me to work for me. I mean, <laughs> I, they have 35, 36 employment cases a year and it's not because they're suing me for sexual harassment or any of that nonsense it's to come back to work for me permanently so they can <laughs> and and because it's almost full permanent employment in the philippines once you get your full full-time 
job, it's almost impossible to fire somebody. So, you know, they don't, you know, they want to come work for me because I pay good and I treat my people good. I treat everybody like family. Um, so, and you've got all these people in the factory and you've also got to make arrangements for their family. So when they get to go home, oh, you know, they, they, you know, <laughs> the distance uh, masks, we started producing our own face shields and our own masks. Uh, Lisa's got a factory that does handbags. We converted it into face mask factory. Uh, and uh, the foundry, uh, when they, uh, when some of their guys had nothing to do, we decided to build some face, uh, face shields for, for the employees so that we didn't have to put so, all the barricades all over the place. And uh, actually it came out pretty de decent considering they're like Jimmy Duff face shields. <laughs> and so the Philippine ambassador to the United States says, hey, Martin, PPEs, man, we have no PPEs. What can you do? A good friend of mine, and he says, I said, I don't know, I made these makeshift face shields. How's these done? <laughs> Two weeks later, we had a mold made, and, and we do them now. Right? We give them to all the frontliners for free. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, the army and the police, uh, we, don't, we don't let them pay for it. We just give it to them. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Martin and I have been friends for so long that that interview ended up running, I don't know, 50 minutes or an hour because there's a lot we had to talk about. So anyway, I'm Michael Bain. Of course, you can find us at michaelbain.tv. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us all over the place. And until next week, you guys stay safe.